Good evening. Today is the 25th Sunday in Ordinary Time. Today's celebrant is Father Scott Whitfield. Mass intentions are for Jean Valeriano and Stiena Thomas, and special intentions for the members of our St. Augustine's Prayer Network. Please silent all cell phones. Thank you. The Mass is beginning. Please stand. Is number 530, Table of Plenty, 530 in the glory and praise. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And with, with your spirit. spirit. Brothers and sisters, let us acknowledge our sins, and so prepare to celebrate the sacred mysteries. Almighty God, have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to people of good will. We pray.
let us pray. O God, who founded all the commands of your sacred law upon love of you and of our neighbor, grant that by keeping your precepts we may merit to attain eternal life. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. A reading from the Book of Wisdom. The godless say, let us lie in wait for the righteous one who makes life inconvenient to us and opposes our actions, who reproaches us for sins against the law and accuses us of sins against our training. Let us see if his words are true and let us test what will happen at the end of his life. For if the righteous one is God's son, God will help him and will deliver him from the hand of his adversaries. Let us test him with insult and torture so that we may find out how gentle he is and make trial of his forbearance. Let us condemn him to a shameful death. According to what he says, he will be protected. The word of the Lord. We will sing Psalm 185 in the Catholic Book of Worship, number 185. A reading from the letter of St. James. Beloved, where there is envy and selfish ambition, there will also be disorder and wickedness of every kind. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace for those who make peace. Those conflicts and disputes among you, where do they come from? Do they not come from your cravings that are at war within you? You want something and do not have it, so you commit murder. And you covet something and cannot obtain it, so you engage in disputes and conflicts. 
You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly in order to spend what you get on your pleasures. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Be with you. And with you a reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. After leaving the mountain, Jesus and his disciples went on from there and passed through Galilee. He did not want anyone to know it, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is to be betrayed into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And three days after being killed, he will rise again. But they did not understand what he was saying and were afraid to ask him. Then they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, Jesus asked them, What were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent. For on the way they had argued with one another who was the greatest. Jesus sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. Then he took a little child and put it among them, and taking it in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord. Lord Jesus Christ. Well, I suppose it's appropriate that Jesus raises the whole issue of servant leadership for us today. We are contemplating uh, our, I guess, our electoral ballot uh, to be cast tomorrow or by a mail if you've already done that. It's the servant leadership, it's the kind of leadership to which all Christians are called. Uh, whenever they find themselves in charge. So it's not just uh, elected office, it's whenever you're put in a place of responsibility for others, when you're the boss, the supervisor. But also, of course, when we're talking about political rulers, kings, prime ministers, presidents, and so on. Whenever we are given authority, its use is to be in service of the good. And the Christian is to offer that leadership in humility. It's the leadership we, as a community, should support. Now, the obvious model for us in this regard is, well, of course, it's Jesus Christ. However, we should be careful to presume that simply by, you know, dint of being baptized, confirmed, receiving the Eucharist, we're actually conformed to his person. Or that anyone exercising leadership in our society is, you know, we should presume they're modeling their leadership on Christ just because they say they are public servants. We are servants of God, whether in leadership or not. So our service to others is to be consistent with the servanthood of Jesus. That who we serve is God, and what we serve is good. Now, I've spoken before of how readily so many are captured by ideology. Good then becomes defined by that and not the authentic gospel. History is also filled with charismatic personalities whom people have followed and equate those individuals with the good, 
and slavishly follow after them. Those are clearly two dangers. And so we're called to think critically about the ideas that inform political programs and to do the hard work of asking if a political vision is consistent with the gospel. If the policies, as well intended as they are apt to be, really will bring good results, given what we know about you know, human beings, their weaknesses, their predilection to sin. And so we need to assess those who ask for our support as well, be it in the context of a national election or in the context of our workplace, our volunteer associations, you know, service clubs, amateur sports leagues, and so on. Now, specifically today, we're called to consider leadership in terms of a great temptation, one that Jesus is quick to warn his disciples about. That's the great temptation in seeking after, well, glory, reputation, the world's praise, or its fear of you, to be thought, well, great, or in this case, the greatest. This leads us, giving in to this temptation, to forget, you know, who we are and what our vocation is. That in whatever capacity we serve the community, we are working always to bring people into right relationship with God through Christ. So Jesus is clearly concerned about this and acts quickly. He wants to correct the apostles when he hears them arguing over this who is greatest question. And remember, these men actually benefit from direct and near constant contact with our Lord. They see him every day, and yet they fail to appreciate him as a model of leadership. It's a model they need to learn for the days when they shall be shepherds of the flocks around the ancient world. It's a model we need to learn and know for our interactions with the world, to give faithful witness. You know, consider Christ's example as described by St. Paul in his famous letter to the church at Philippi. He writes, you know, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death. Yes, even death on a cross. So, to translate into what might be our temptation, you might find yourself that because of your relationship with Christ, you might think somehow you're better off than the rest of people, as redeemed through Christ's blood, a little closer to the angels than the rest of humanity. And you know, that may be so. But that's not something we can use as a source of our authority. As Jesus says elsewhere in the Gospels, don't lord it over others like the Gentiles do. If in any regard you know yourself to have a gift, a grace received through the Holy Spirit that gives you an advantage, a special capacity, it's not to be used for your glory, but always to be offered to God's glory. You know, I spoke uh, recently about our patron, St. Augustine, a few weeks ago at the patronal feast of his being a man living at the end of an age, at the end of what we call the ancient world. During his lifetime, the city of Rome was successfully assaulted and sacked over a period of three days by barbarians. That was in the year 410 AD. And it was absolutely traumatizing for people. They just could not fathom that this had happened. And yet it did. And so people wanted to know, how could this have occurred? This is the great Roman Empire, and yet its capital falls and is, is, is uh, sacked over three days. So a lot of people, putting on their good old logic cap, argued that, it, well, it's all the Christians' fault. Christianity, you know, was a persecuted faith when the empire was at its height and its great glory, and the catastrophe has now come with the church ascendant and the emperor no longer sacrificing to ancient gods. So they argued, hey, this is clear where the fault lies. Now, any decent historian of the period will tell you that from the time of Augustus on down to the fall of the empire, one, good emperors were exceptional, Mediocre ones were the norm, and too many of them were simply vile. That the competition for the position of emperor led to assassinations, coups, and all sorts of turmoil at the top that meant for long periods of time there was no effective leadership, just good old Roman bureaucracy grinding along. Spending was out of control, inflation was constant, the money was debased. 
The bureaucracy of the empire had grown huge and burdensome, and it became a system more of internal control rather than one of administering the state's services. The army was often seen as more a threat to people than the barbarians we were all supposed to be afraid of and that the army was to protect them from. They would often extort from the emperor's bonuses and pay rises. It was a time when the empire needed exceptional leadership across the board and at many levels, and it just didn't have it. And Augustine knew that. He knew that well enough. And so he composed his famous defense of Christianity in the book, City of God. And the central problem he identified, what it was in his estimation, the real issue was this seeking after glory, this looking for the good reputation, this wanting acclaim and admiration above all. That was the problem from the top on down. And from this, all the particular problems flowed. Yeah, so sometimes an emperor did do something that was a real substantial good for people. Not often enough. But you can legitimately celebrate it. But more often than not, it was glory seeking. The glory of bloody conquest. You know, Julius Caesar, the famous general and sort of first emperor, he himself admitted that when he went to war, it wasn't to defend Rome, not to eradicate some great evil. It was to enhance his reputation, bring him wealth and prestige, and so political power. You know, in an even worse way, in the time when Augustine lived, so many of those in political power just demanded to be glorified for nothing more than having achieved that political office. They didn't actually do anything with it, but they figured they'd made it to the top of the heap and ought to be celebrated for the fact. Augustine quoted to his readers, the Roman historian Sallust, who wrote that Romans were greedy of praise, prodigal of wealth, desirous of great glory, that they would sacrifice everything, curb every desire if it gained them glory. And you know, glory was, and for many still is, a path to immortality. Ancient people believed that, you know, as long as the stories continue to be told about them, the poems sung about their triumphs, their conquests, that somehow, they lived on through that. In one's limited lifetime, one could then sort of reflect on one's achievements and have one's heart warmed by the thought that people will be talking about me for eons to come. You know, today we talk about political leaders writing themselves into the history books, being concerned with their legacy. On the more ordinary level of day-to-day -day life, we know that recognition from the public from colleagues, the praise of one's superiors, the tributes of one's subordinates. It's something that a lot of people desire. It tells them, I guess, that their lives are a success. It affirms them in their life choices. It makes you feel good to be recognized. Of course, you know, there's no immortality. There's no eternal life in any of this. Enlisting your awards in your obituary isn't what's going to get you into heaven. Eventually, the stories will be forgotten. I mean, think about how many people still read classical history? Who, who cracks open Roman poetry these days to read the heroic odes by Virgil or Horace? You know, the sales awards that we get, the plaques and trophies, they're just going to gather dust, and eventually, I'm sorry to say, they get tossed out. So one must be humble in the face of this reality. However, St. Augustine also warned against false humility, the pose of the ambitious that so often suckers us, the, we, the plebs. You know, like the Pharisee who paraded his virtuous generosity, as Jesus said, he has received his reward. You know, they knew that trick in ancient Rome. We know it today in the person who parades their humility in front of others. As St. Augustine put it, if the humility does not proceed from the Holy Spirit, that person isn't holy or good. At best, he or she is just less corrupt. Christian leadership lies not so much, say, in leading the charge to take that hill, or getting your staff to finish the presentation that wins the big contract, or coaching the team to the championship. It's in leading the men of the platoon, those people in the marketing department, the kids on the basketball team, to become something more than self-interested, self-concerned individuals, but rather outward-looking people whose motivation is not the admiration of others, not the praise of the world, 
but in doing something good, actually accomplishing something, not just talking about it. And when we look at Christ, we don't see someone who bosses people around. He does not try to control them either. He instructs. He coaches. He does not demand respect. He doesn't even rely on his authority. People simply sense it. Christ does not use fear to motivate nor lead by threats. I mean, it's true, he speaks of the consequences of sin being hell, but that isn't in his instruction to the disciples for their mission. That's a warning for us all. He does not use people as a means to an end. You know, the end for which he came is the salvation of God's people. Christ is a servant leader who inspires his followers and he does not demand respect, but rather earns their allegiance by his good example. He does not ask us to do anything he would not do himself. He's confident, and his confidence is infectious. We know he sent his disciples out on their own on several occasions. He trusted them to collaborate effectively with him. And when they returned, he celebrated their accomplishments, and he eagerly listened to their stories learned of their experiences, and so he built them up spiritually. When the disciples, especially Peter, fail him so dismally, you know, he doesn't come after the resurrection to lay blame, to castigate, or to shame, but rather he repairs the relationship between himself and his disciples and among his followers. And so he gently corrects the course of their lives away from embarrassment and toward a new and greater confidence in themselves as agents of the gospel. He is patient with them, and he appreciates their limitations, but even more so, he knows their potential and that it will be realized in the light of his resurrection. His rising of the dead could be seen as strictly his own triumph, yet he gladly invites everyone, all of us, to share in it. It allows us in our own small struggles to be joined to his great struggle. And so we are assured of success if we are with him. Now, I know that no one can ever be a leader so completely as Jesus Christ. But when we look at those who offer leadership, look for that strong resemblance when we offer ourselves as leaders. In the mirror, we should see a humble servant, but also our Savior at our side. Let us now stand and confess our faith according to the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. United in the spirit who helps us to pray rightly, let us now ask the Lord to give us and all people whatever is for our good. That today's special intentions are for members of our St. Augustine's Prayer Network. May they know that God is for them in their need. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer that the Lord will show great care for the dead, especially Jean Valeriano and Stiena Thomas, and raise them up to internal life. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Let us ask the Lord to show great care for us as we remember our needs.
Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear, hear our prayer. prayer. That the Lord will give us whatever is helpful and defend us from whatever is harmful. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Lord God, great and everlasting is your care for us. Receive these prayers we have made to you and answer them for the sake of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, who is Lord forever and ever. Amen. Amen. We will sing number 553, Come With Me Into the Fields, number 553, In the Glory and Praise. Pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice at your hands for the praise and glory of his name, for our good and the good of all his holy church. Receive with favor, O Lord, we pray, the offerings of your people, that what they profess with devotion and faith may be theirs, through these heavenly mysteries, through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks. Lord, Holy Father, almighty and eternal God, through Christ our Lord. For through his paschal mystery, he accomplished the marvelous deed by which he has freed us from the yoke of sin and death, summoning us to the glory of being now called a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for your own possession to proclaim everywhere your mighty works. For you have called us out of darkness into your own wonderful light. And so with angels and archangels, with thrones and dominions, and with all the hosts and powers of heaven, 
we sing the hymn of your glory as without end we acclaim. indeed holy, O Lord, and all you have created rightly gives you praise. For through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and working of the Holy Spirit, you give life to all things and make them holy, and you never cease to gather a people to yourself, so that from the rising of the sun to its setting, a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name. Therefore, O Lord, we humbly implore you, by the same Spirit, graciously make holy these gifts we have brought to you for consecration, that they may become the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate these mysteries. For on the night he was betrayed, he himself took bread. And giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, and gave the chalice to his disciples saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. We proclaim your death, O Lord, and profess your resurrection until you come again. Therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of, this, what, the, <clears throat> of the saving passion of your Son, his wondrous resurrection and ascension into heaven, and as we look forward to his second coming, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Look, we pray, upon the oblation of your church, and recognizing the sacrificial victim by whose death you willed to reconcile us to yourself, grant that we who are nourished by the body and blood of your Son and filled with his Holy Spirit, may become one body, one spirit in Christ. May he make of us an eternal offering to you, so that we may obtain an inheritance with your elect, especially with the most blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, with your blessed apostles and glorious martyrs, with Saint Augustine, and with all the saints on whose constant intercession in your presence we rely for unfailing help. May the sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, O Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Be pleased to confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth, with your servant Francis, our Pope, Douglas, our Bishop, and Wayne, our Auxiliary Bishop, 
the order of bishops, all the clergy, and the entire people you have gained for your own. Listen graciously to the prayers of this family whom you have summoned before you. In your compassion, O merciful Father, gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world. To our departed brothers and sisters, and to all who are pleasing to you at their passing from this life, give kind admittance to your kingdom. There we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory. Through Christ our Lord, through whom you bestow on the world all that is good. Through him and with him and in him, O God, almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. At the Savior's command and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our, Our Father, Father, who art, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, come, thy will be done, done on earth as it, as is, it in is in heaven. heaven. Give, give us, us this day our daily, daily bread, bread, and, and forgive us our trespasses, trespasses as, as we forgive those who trespass, trespass against, against us. And lead us not, not into temptation, temptation but, deliver but deliver us from us evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit. Let us offer each other the sign of peace. Body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, be your life to us who receive it. Jesus Christ. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter into my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. Body of Christ, keep me safe.
Please join in singing from the glory and praise, five, two, four.
Let us pray. Graciously raise up, O Lord, those you renew with this sacrament, that we may come to possess your redemption, both in mystery and in the manner of our life. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. So we received a reminder from the, uh, the diocese that next week, uh, and this will go out as an email this week as well as a reminder that we have a special collection uh, next Saturday and Sunday for the needs of the church in Canada. So that is an appeal from the, the uh, CCCB, that's Cat the Conference of Ca Canadian Catholic Bishops. Have I got that right? I'm just <laughs> these acronyms. It is to fund the national programs of the church. That includes uh, reconciliation programs with our indigenous peoples, uh, national, um, any other national program, special assistance and special programs, funds conferences, funds uh, educational programs, etc. So that's uh, funding for the church on a national basis. It is a special collection. Just a reminder that that will be next week uh, and that uh, special envelope will be made available for that. Uh, Thanksgiving pies. I don't know if you saw that as you came in through the door. The CWL, I think, has struck onto just an excellent idea because it involves pie. Um, to sell pie. I'd, I'd like it just that they just gave pie, but I, you know, we have to be practical about these things. It is a fundraiser. It's a fundraiser for the CW Well uh, next week to come and uh, order slash prepay uh, for uh, pies, all $12 each. Numbers, uh, limited number will be available. So uh, they'll, they'll probably at some point uh, get, get, start getting short on the number of pies. I don't know what the overall number is. However, that will be uh, something you'll go over to the parish center. Saturday after Mass, Sunday after Masses, uh, to order them. And then the pickup will be at the Paris Center again, Saturday afternoon, October 9th, from 1 to 3 o'clock. Uh, and then after all the Masses that weekend. Again, these uh, proceeds from this is to fund the CWL activities, which I, I won't go into an exhaustive list, but uh, they have a lot of outreach in the community. Uh, they also uh, are very generous with the parish as well in raising funds. For example, uh, they'll be funding new, new linens for the, the altar. Uh, they do offer uh, bursaries to students, etc. So, uh, indeed, if you want to learn more, time, time to get in touch with Phyllis Missett and the other ladies of the CWL to know about all that they do. Next week as well, Fall Bottle and Can Drive. This is being uh, done by our uh, local of the Knights of Columbus uh, in support of their charities. So drop off all wine, beer, and spirit containers and we'll make it easier for you, it says here. Donate as the Knights will meet you at the parish parking lot to collect the empties from your trunk next Saturday, September 25th, 10 a.m. to 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Or if you like, you can meet the Knights with your empties at our collection point located in the area near the parish hall garage. It just makes it a slightly shorter walk for them to, to get it organized, but in the parking lot or the area just in front of the parish center garage. Uh, lastly, uh, the gluten-free host uh, issue, or low gluten host. Uh, I, I uh, made mention of it last week, um, and nonetheless, they keep disappearing. So uh, again, gently police this for us. If you see anyone taking the low gluten host, please, please uh, gently point out to them they're not to be taken home. They're for use in the Mass, at the Mass, and they're for those who, well, because of reasons of, of a serious, uh, I suppose it's an allergy or intolerance, need that host as opposed to the regular hosts. They are not consecrated. There's nothing particularly holy or sanctified about them. So uh, we need to keep that supply. They're not, we don't have them by the bushel either. They're always a special order. And indeed, Cindy has called over to uh, our liturgical supply place, and sometimes they don't have them. So we like to try to keep as many on hand as possible uh, for the needs of those few people in our parish so that they can celebrate the Eucharist with us. So if you see anyone picking one up, thinking, you know, this, this is a little keepsake, something to take home, just point out to them, it's, it's nothing. It's nothing until it's consecrated, and it's really nothing until it's received by the faithful person for whom it's intended. So I just gently do that. Don't want any confrontations, but uh, it's just, it's something that we, we need to keep on hand and, and keep some control over. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace, glorifying the Lord by your life. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. We will sing glory and praise to our God, number 671 in the glory and praise. 
671.